My name is Calliope, daughter of the sky god Zeus, and muse of much renown. Sit here, at my perfumed feet, as my poem unfolds before you, an epic that springs from the depths of the sea and finds its end upon strange shores. For this is your story, the story of Argonus, son of Argus the shipbuilder and friend to Jason the hero. Our tale begins like many a sailor's story before it, with tragedy and a lilting song that carries from one dark wave to the next. Awaken. Book One, The Blight. A frozen scream is etched upon the face of bewitched Typhus, helmsman of the Argo. Never again shall he foretell the rising of black waves. This owl seems unaware of its preternatural perch and unconcerned with the plight of a shipwrecked sailor. This isle is littered with such debris, broken reminders of man's folly. No craftsman could sculpt a child so lifelike, nor create that which now stands lifeless. The death that haunts this isle did not spare abundant with boughs of leaves. This mosaic appears to be made of limestone, and thus surprisingly light. The death that haunts this isle did not spare even a child from its sorcerous wrath. Light glints off this strange carved stone, half buried in the sand. Her planks broken and her floorboards shattered, this skiff offers naught but harbor to small fish. This statue is of Amphitrite, Queen of the Sea. Sadly, the goddess did little to hinder the decimation that litters these rocky shallows. The water that flows from these rocks would keep even the most stalwart from discerning what lies beyond. The chalky fleece of this yew is wanting for a shearer's work.
May these words recount the strange toils of Argonus, chronicler and maker of maps, washed up on strange shores and awakened by the voice of a goddess. And what brought me thus, kneeling upon white sands? Twas a fell song, carried from one wave to the next, until it met the faithful Argo and pulled her deep, shattering both bow and stern. Now she lies broken amongst sharp rocks, never again to bring men to great adventure. Oh, and what adventures! All that could have been and now will never be. They are as foam upon pounding surf. The fickle gods, the very ones to whom this sailor offered tribute, have scorned us, forsaken us without rebuke or counsel. They have cast me upon bedeviled sod and set horrors before my eyes. My brethren, the fabled Argonauts, are no more. Men I supped with just a day hands are now naught but pallid and sorcelled stone to be ravaged by wind and storm. Indeed, I am a man of many sorrows, but shall I not press onward? For good or ill? Mayhap the blight that has taken these brave men has not overcome all. Though my body is weary, my brow feverish, I shall not abandon them. So says Argonus, son of the shipbuilder Argus. This rotten timber is too small to be a yard for the mast. Tis naught but a fisherman's net, set so the west winds can reach its sodden threads. While man may have birthed this massive sculpture from the isle's bedrock, deep waters now embrace it as their own. This statue would appear newly struck, as the salt of the sea has yet to assail its stone. This hound was not spared the fate that befell the other inhabitants of this isle. Whether spooked or merely provoked, the stallion launches itself from the cliffside before mighty wings carry it far above the awestruck sailor below. Nearly 200 men high, the massive bronze soldier stands silent, enthralled by the euphonious song rising from below. Though salty mists shroud their form, there is no denying the women upon the rocks. Or even from here, the lure of the siren's song is strong. Massive stone doors are cradled by the sheer cliff face. A semblance of Pacify, the immortal daughter of the sun god Helios, guards the entrance into this mountain. The bell-shaped flowers of this mandragora are common throughout the Isles of Greece.
while the foundation of this temple is interred, the architrave and frieze of the entablature remains. Tis Palamonius, son of Olanain Lernus, whose bodily frame and valour no man could match. Long, twisted necks adorn the pitted surface of this stone tablet. This young woman, most likely a temple worshipper, seems to have been frozen in time. This child was not struck down by mortal ills, but surely by something that is beyond this world. This grotesque statue is that of Honorable Castor, skilled to guide swift-footed steeds. Finding a trinket such as this upon these shores, let alone within the boughs of this tree, must surely be a portent. The head of a once giant stone statue lies half hidden in tall grass and underbrush. While it appears to be chiseled from the same rock, this stone is set apart from the great statue that cradles it. Small ticks, like droplets of water, emanate from within this stone pedestal. The odd shape of this blue-grey stone gives nary a hint of its purpose. The stone drops neatly into the groove and the great eye slowly moves, revealing a hidden passageway. An intricate carving of a fish betrays which god inhabits the temple beyond. This woman was no doubt on her way to pay tribute within the temple. Her last moments of horror remain etched upon her face. This carving is assuredly the work of a master craftsman. Ancient tome in hand, this priest was caught unawares and is now made of the same stone as the carved god behind him.
While this woman was surely an attendant of the temple, she shall never again set evening lamps alight. Even the pious have not been spared the bewitchment that has befallen this isle. The shape of this stone tablet, embellished with detailed illustrations, would indicate that it is incomplete. Colorful tiles create an exquisite depiction of the sea god ruling his realm. This vase, portraying Poseidon and a merhorse, may have once held water or oil, painstakingly carved by the pious Reliefs such as this can be found in any temple from here to Lurcia. Painstakingly carved by the pious. Reliefs such as this can be found in any temple from here to Lurcia, unlike the unearthly statuary that inhabit this isle. This towering statue of Poseidon shows the workmanship of a master sculptor's hand. Unencumbered by the burdens of man, this mosaic depicts the gods both at war and at rest. This stone is bereft of markings, offering no explanation for the small depression set into its surface. The yellow light it emits is curious. The lovely purple color of this flower conceals its poisonous nature. An unseen hand forces Argonus from his feet and into a dense thicket skirting the stone path. A soothing voice murmurs in his ear as the sailor witnesses the passage of things only spoken of in tall tales, and even then, in whispers. Be quiet for but a moment, the voice counsels. Once the otherworldly creatures fade from sight, Argonus pulls himself from the dust and gazes skyward. Before him, held aloft, is a handsome woman, replete with glory and power. How many times must fair Athena save one man? The immortal asks, her head tilted with uncommon grace, her eyes soft. Before words can form on Argonus's lips, she continues. Tis not a query to be answered so readily, sailor of the Argo. Shadows gather, she says. There is a blight upon this isle, 
Have you not seen its handiwork? The flesh of your companions no longer flesh. Their bones, that of the earth. The woman's eyes drop. I fear my own hand may have set these dire events into motion. For this, I will make amends. But know well, many of your brethren yet live, for I have seen them with my own eyes. Find them, Argonus of Crete, and as I did for your father before you, I shall provide a boat and passage from this isle. You have the word of fair Athena. Not a heartbeat later, the goddess is gone, and breath gladly returns to the sailor's lungs. The statue is certainly that of the hero, Oileus, peerless in courage and strong in spirit. Tis Phalerus of the Ashen Spear. His father, great Alcon, shall never again welcome home his prodigal son. No doubt struck by the hand of an Argonaut, the head of the Hydra lies lifeless, its flesh still warm to the touch. Hail strong Erebotes, the son of Iris, skilled in the seer's art of seeing between the mortal coil and the dark veil beyond. Paul Canthus, son of Abbas, Never was there a sailor more eager to quest or raise weapons against a common foe. It is said that he was granted an enchanted weapon from Ares himself. Calais was a welcome comrade and could fashion ships to make trial of the seas with heavy oars. Tenorus has lost a great son in Euphemus. He was the most swift-footed of men, and was wont to skim the swell of endless seas. Tis the visage of strong Asterius, son of Hipparasius, who stood two score of men against the Gaginais on the land of the Dolionis. If not for its stone plight, this Methosian Hydra is like the one said to have been brought low by Heracles during his twelve labors. This wayfarer's spear is both a formidable weapon and a sailor's crutch. are those who chance upon this manuscript, only to marvel, perhaps in disbelief, that a goddess appeared, let alone spoke, to a simple sailor. Whether for grandiosity or merciful boon, fair Athena has once again brought me from certain harm. Yet this time it was not from deep water's grasp that she pulled a drowning man. This peril moved quickly set high upon slithering tails. Tis true, for I have beheld such. And what wisdom flowed from the lips of the goddess, parting to mortal man? Admonishment? Pity? No, not but hope. Upon each honeyed word I clung, drawn to them as a moth to a distant light within a dark wood. Then a covenant was struck between fair Athena and this sailor. 
find my stalwart companions, those who yet live and are scattered upon these shores. And though horrors surely await, she will lead us down gentle paths to a waiting boat and safe passage from this isle. While the tip of this spear may no longer be fit for battle, it using the broken spear, Argonus plucks the necklace from its roost before laying it about his neck. This necklace is not unlike one. Removing the necklace, Argonus holds it before the statue, praying silently that Poseidon recognizes it and grants audience to a weary wayfarer. The great sea god does not disappoint. Within seconds, marble shudders, foundations shake, and the heart of Argonus is quickened. The Lord of All Waters speaks. Who would call upon Poseidon, only to be found wanting of tribute or song? Poseidon stretches forth his arm. Where are my concerts and vassals? Look about you. You may seek them, but they will not be found. They have deserted me, forsaken me, in this darkest of hours. And who has set loose the scourge that you have borne witness? Athena's puppet. The son of Danai and Zeus himself! The sea god pauses for a moment, taking measure of the sailor before him. Yet, even so, my anger is not fit to be laid upon the shoulders of my bondservants, let alone set upon one whose necklace bears my mark. Leave me to my grief and seek me no more. 
I have opened a way for you. Take it if you wish, or abandon it. It matters little. The statue of the sea god turns his gaze away from the sailor and speaks no more. This stone is bereft of markings, offering no explanation for the small depression set into its surface. The yellow light it emits is curious. The snow-white owl is beautiful and strangely comforting as well. This young woman, most likely a temple worshipper, seems to have been frozen in time. I have offered many a prayer to the gods of the sea, fervently petitioning favor while tossed upon great swells within dark storms. Yet it was not until my foot felt consecrated ground that any scales of disbelief fell from my eyes. Within my heart, I feared the very thing that has taken grip of the isle has rendered this temple nothing less than a tomb. For those who would worship here have succumbed as well. Now the same ashen stone as those who pulled oars upon the Argo's solid decks. But within the midst of the dead, did mighty Poseidon, Lord of all waters, arise and speak, his voice a trumpet within sacred halls. Anger and fury rode upon his words, and a great grief followed close behind. He spoke of the son of Danai and of Zeus, whom I know from my studies to be Honorable Perseus. But even with this discernment, how that hero is culpable for such great sorrows is, in itself, a great mystery. And though I paid no honor to Poseidon, nor did I bring him tribute or sacrifice, grace fell from the sea god's hand. My form was spared his wrath, and the rush of great waters grew distant until they could be heard no more.
small boats such as this lie broken upon the sands of this isle. Driftwood or not, this length of having survived the wreck of the Argo, Agamedus, a brave comrade, fell to bewitchment and is now naught but a perch for birds. Lord Poseidon spared neither the mighty Argo nor her oarsman Danaeus, whose once tanned flesh is now made of the same sharp rocks about him. Here stands strong Coronus, warder of Acalia and friend to all who put oar to Poseidon's dark waters. Now nothing more than sodden planks, this skiff is a home to small crabs and fish. A small opening, no wider than two shields, can be seen in the cliff's face. Of men who would share the toils of his brethren, none compare to fair Asterion. Never again shall this beast of burden pull cart or dray beneath a scorching sun. The blight of which Athena spoke has left a trail of sorrow in its wake. The simple robe of this man betrays him as an the creature that appears on this tablet is well documented. Tis a harpy, as cruel a beast as the gods have wrought. Laden with empty barrels, this wooden cart sits idle, its heavy wheels resting in well-used ruts. This wayward pig is concerned only for that which will feed its large belly. Powered by the large blades, a heavy stone moves slowly within a wide grinder. This chicken wanders aimlessly upon the sod, as chickens are wont to do. The great Phidias of Athens himself could not craft a sculpture so lifelike, yet lifeless. The look of horror on this mother's face is a thing to haunt dreams and undoubtedly part of a larger mosaic. This piece deserves additional study, as it neither man nor woman is granted mercy from the scourge that stalks this isle. Neither discarded coins nor any telltale markings can be seen within this fount.
With a grunt of satisfaction, Argonus finds the correct spot for the piece of sandstone. Argonus places the tablet onto the wall. The piece of sandstone fits snugly within the hole. While placing the piece in the proper spot, childhood memories flit through Argonus's mind. Argonus places the tablet onto the wall. The bane of this isle has claimed both the young and the elderly without prejudice. The proper use of flint and steel is taught at an early age to every Greek child. This cart is in fine shape and only in need of an ox or horse. Uncovered food such as this is sure to draw flies. Based on the circumstances, it seems unlikely a family will ever gather around this table again. Judging by its appearance, the stone pestle has seen its fair share of use. Tis a pouch made of sheepskin, complete with leather drawstring. This parchment appears to be a recipe of sorts and provides illustrations of the required ingredients as well. The sailor pulls the mandragora from his satchel and places it in the mixing bowl. Without fanfare, the purple flower is added to the mixing bowl.
This sack likely contains grain. Or perhaps this hide has been set out to dry, no doubt to later be used as clothing or bedding. This shelf could easily accommodate additional vases and jars. Sadly, pleading for one's life will not deter that which relishes in bringing both horror and death. Clothes have been set to dry on this clothesline. A few uninteresting items rest upon this table. This large shelf is stocked with various vases and bowls. Poorly made wooden chairs frame an equally paltry table. A few distinct images, animal skins, have been laid across this small wooden bed. Small chairs have been set about. This small bed looks uncomfortable, even to a lost, weary sailor. Small bits of stone have been inlaid into this tablet forming the image of several teeth. The form of a child, still in mid-stride, is no more than a lifeless statue within tall grass. Clearly caught unawares, this simply dressed man hinders entrance into or egress from this build. This creature had nary a chance to escape its petrified fate. Although no fire burns within, this clay stove is still warm to the touch. Uncovered food such as this is sure to draw flies. Having endured sore afflictions and beached ships, tis sad to see Arius, son of Bias and brother of Taleos. Tis Ergonus, whose lyre charmed stubborn rocks upon the mountains, 
and the course of rivers. Zetes, the son of Boreas, shall stand battle ready for all eternity. Much like her life, this elderly priestess's torch has not only been snuffed, but petrified. The eyes of this man appear as if pleading, begging to be released from a stone prison. Whatever prayers of supplication this woman lifted to the gods went unheeded and apparently unanswered. While impressive statues dedicated to the goddess Hera are not uncommon, the dirt provoked by the wandering sailor, the great statue of Hera moves, her unblinking eyes falling upon Argonus. Who are you, Argonus? Historian? Storyteller? Map maker? Of these things I have no need. Tis a warrior's heart, I see. With that, the goddess turns away and becomes stone once more. This stone is bereft of markings offering no explanation for the small depression set into its surface. The yellow light it emits is curious. The odd shape of this blue-gray stone gives nary a hint of its purpose. This shallow pond reflects tall stones set about it as if to keep the water captive within this golden veil. The insatiable hunger of harpies is well documented. The beast's desire for gold, however, is not. This parchment is inscribed with three illustrations of native flora. Next to it is a pouch made of sheepskin, complete with leather drawstring. Flint and steel are inadequate to start a fire by themselves. A soft tinder is required to produce the flame. One can become extremely ill, consuming the berries from this black nightshade.
tireless winds blow past the form of fair Alcon, who was well skilled at inferring from sun and star the stormy winds. The stone piece appears to fit perfectly into the space on the wall. This parchment is inscribed with three illustrations of native flora. Next to each is a name and a brief description. Datura, purple trumpet flower. Black nightshade, white flowers with berries. Mandragora, green leaves with red flowers. Near the bottom is a drawing of fire, and within it, a single word. Sleep. Heavy ropes bind the rungs of this simple wooden ladder. Both the leaves and berries of this black nightshade are dropped unceremoniously into the bowl. The bowl filled, Argonus crushes the ingredients into a pulpy mix, one that smells faintly of lavender. This simple bowl and accompanying ware are no... Argonus takes the newly created mixture and drops it into the small pouch. This pouch has been filled with a mixture of three strange poisonous ingredients. Argonus places the ladder against the rocky cliff before driving the legs into the wet sand. Heavy ropes bind the rungs of this simple wooden ladder.
silver drachmas are not uncommon, but the scoring on this piece is unusual. It would be more fitting were it found within Hades' temple. This blade, known as a Zephos, has been neglected. Its edges are dull and the metal is rusted with age. Sword raised, Argonus calls upon Hera, praying the great goddess will reveal herself. The mother of Ares obliges the sailor when the statue slowly comes to life and stone lips part. Argonus, she says, stand where you are and move no closer, for you are on holy ground. I have watched you from afar. I have seen your metal. I have felt your anguish. Did you know that the gods feel anguish as well? Perhaps not for fallen comrades, but certainly for that which has been taken from us. Zeus's pets have taken to roost, defiling my golden orchard, which now lies fallow. I need but one warrior who would reclaim it. Reclaim my honor. Would the name of Argonus be immortalized thus? Argonus says nothing and raises his sword once again. Hera nods even as the sailor feels her eyes move from his face to his chest and then finally resting upon his weapon. But this sword is ill-suited for such a task. Its blade is dulled, but I will grind it fine. Its tip broken, but I will make it like new. Hera transforms the weapon, reshaping the steel with nothing more than a wave of her hand. As Argonus marvels at the restored sword, Hera reverts to stone, but not before a final warning. Prove yourself, Sailor of the Argo, and you shall be rewarded. Fail in this and not even Athena can save you. Mm -hmm. 
the statue does not move, nor does Hera appear within it. Whatever has passed, and whatever lies before me, I shall never forget the commission laid upon my shoulders by the Queen of the Gods herself. The marvel of Hera's appearance alone would have rendered this simple man dumbstruck, if not for the tales told to me by trusted Argonauts. For I have sailed with men who consorted with gods long before my sandaled foot touched bewitched sand. They have set tall sails on dark rising swells that no other ship has traversed. They have gazed over wooden bulwarks at impossible sights and have seen the dust of vast armies hide the sun. Under starry skies I stood, beneath Hero Jason's shadow, listening to their stories, fashioning maps of isles that guarded primordial treasures archiving grand quests steeped in truth and bound for legend, tales to rival those told in the halls of my fathers. But those things are beyond me now. Mighty Argo rests forever upon a strange shore, her keel shattered, her memories carried aloft by dark waves and lost to boundless waters. Enough, for today is ripe with troubles of its own. If the gods wish to make themselves known to a simple sailor, to call upon me with great labors, I shall be at the ready and face them as my brothers did, as an Argonaut. The short sword has been transformed, its blade no longer pitted, its sharp edge made perfect for slash. Silver drachmas are not uncommon, but the scoring on this piece is unusual. Twould be more fitting were it found within Hades' temple. The eyes of this man appear as if pleading, begging to be released from a stone prison. Neither discarded coins nor any telltale markings can be seen within this fount. The mosaic piece that occupied this space is missing.
Argonus drives the enchanted sword into the Hydra's mouth. But even using considerable force, the sailor of the Argo can extract no more than three of the beast's teeth. The statue does not. While impressive statues dedicated to the goddess Hera are not uncommon, the dearth of pious attendance is troubling. As if awaiting the first act of a great play, a circle of tall, silent stones surround Argonus as he reaches for the teeth of the Hydra. With a sweep of his arm, he tosses them into the shallow water, like a farmer sowing his field after winter's winds have faded. The ground trembles beneath the sailor's feet, followed by an uneasy silence. Then, one by one, skeletal foot soldiers rise, their stalwart shields bearing the mark of the very thing that birthed them. The undead warriors look to the trees and move as one toward the harpies that desecrate their branches. They engage the beasts with fury, raising sword and spear staining the green sod below with splatters. After a short skirmish, the dogs of Zeus relent and are driven from the dense boughs and into grey skies. Victorious, the skeletons remain, ensuring the safety of the goddess's orchard.
let it be known that while I did not sail with the Phoenician Prince Cadmus, I knew one other who sowed the teeth of a dragon. Jason, hero of the Argo and burglar of the Golden Fleece. At a shallow fount, tall stones set about, and a great tree at its head, I stood, the teeth of the mighty Hydra within my palm. With the goddess's words in my ears, I raised my hand and cast my prize into the shallow waters. I thought myself prepared, yet amazement and fear welled within my breast, gripping my heart. Skeletal foot soldiers, their polished shields bearing the Hydra's mark, rose from the earth and looked to the trees, whose great boughs bore the weight of the harpies, foul beasts who desecrate and destroy. But they were no match for the children of the Hydra. With sword and spear, the dogs of Zeus were driven from the fair glade and into gray skies high above. And so, by my hand, the grove of the goddess Hera was made pure once again. This shallow pond reflects tall stones Set about it as if to keep the water captive, sword in hand, this skeleton moves silently beneath the trees, patrolling Hera's orchard. Whether the golden skin of these apples was transmuted or grew as such, is just one of the many mysteries upon this isle. Whether the golden skin of these apples was transmuted or grew as such is just one of the many mysteries upon this isle. This skeleton remains, ensuring that the harpies will never again alight upon these golden boughs. It takes naught but a few heartbeats for the statue to stir, and the mother of all gods to awake. Well done, sailor of the Argo, Hera says. You have driven the harpies from the bowels of my orchard. Their broad wings have taken them into the skies, and their lamentations are heard no more. And what is your reward for such courage? Gold that rests within your palm? Your name remembered in my great halls? Yes, it shall be these things, the goddess says as she returns to stone. But step outside this place and see if it can be so much more.
Gazing skyward, Argonus witnesses Hera's promise glide down to the earth upon wings of purest white. No doubt a gift from the goddess Hera herself, a noble steed with white wings and ivory coat stands waiting. The winged horse is skittish and rebuffs the sailor's attempt to ride the creature. Argonus has yet to earn the steed's trust. Golden apple in hand, Argonus approaches the stallion with trepidation, but the sailor's worries prove unfounded when the horse gently shakes his snow-white mane and accepts the gift. Sensing a kinship, Argonus straddles the great winged horse and for a few moments at least, leaves the burdens of the world far below him.